Hello and welcome to GameStack. We're back to feature more games that never left Japan. Well, actually, Joe, we're going to talk about one game that did leave Japan technically, but it never came out in the United States, and I, I thought I'd add it. Dave, you know the rules. I know, I know, but, you know, this is an awesome game, and you hadn't even heard of it before, so oh. I thought it'd be cool to, you know, show it, because okay. it's a good import. Okay, well, let's check out your selection of games, then. Wonder 3 Arcade Gears is a Capcom arcade game that has three types of games in one cabinet. I always thought this was called Three Wonders. Well, it could be, I don't know. A little something for everyone is what Capcom must have been thinking. Included in this pack, one or two players is an action platformer called Rooster, a side-scrolling shooter called Chariot, and a puzzle game called Don't Pull. All awesome names I know. So here's a rundown of all three games. Rooster, or his preferred name, Midnight Wanderers. Why is that the preferred name? Because uh, I said so, that's why. This is a side-scrolling action platform game where you play as a little elf-looking character. Your character can shoot up, down, left, and right. You can collect power-ups via treasure chests all over the level, which will give you different types of weapons. All weapons are very effective and get slightly stronger depending on which one you have. You can also collect little option-type things that will help you by shooting automatically as you shoot. They can be helpful, but you can't control them. Your character can sustain two hits before he dies. The music is just average Capcom arcade music. Some of the songs have decent melodies, but they use really shrill instruments that hurt your ears. Speaking of hurting your ears, the sound effects are mostly distorted and the sound is just horrible. Yeah, I agree. Anyways, moving on to Chariot. Here we have a side-scrolling shooter. It's a basic shooter with nothing that makes it stand out. Despite that, it's quite fun as graphics are really nice and the control is great also. I like the art in here and the enemies are drawn really well, especially the boss characters. Your character can choose between two weapon types that can be changed back and forth by collecting either red or green icons. He also collects small orbs that look like a tail on your character. These are your secondary weapons and recharge itself after it's been used. Yeah, I was pretty proud of myself when I discovered that feature. I was proud of you too, Joe. The red icon is a spread shot that isn't very powerful, but its secondary shot is slightly more powerful. The green icon is a straight ahead shot that's fairly powerful. Its secondary shot is a bit wider and about the same in strength. Again, the music and sound effects are Capcom style and are nothing great. Finally, we have the puzzle game Don't Pull. In this game, you control a little rabbit, and the objective of the game is to push blocks and trap your enemies between them. Or you can also clear the level by staying alive until the timer reaches zero. It's a basic puzzle game with good graphics for its style. It's an enjoyable game, but can get boring after prolonged periods of play. Yeah, prolonged being about five or ten minutes, I'd say. Yeah, maybe, unless you really like puzzle games. And finally, the music, as you guessed it, is average. Not as shrill as the previous games, but certainly nothing great. Kid Dracula is a great little action platformer from Konami. I know you're gonna say, hey, wait, doofus, this game was released for the Game Boy in America. Yes, you are correct in saying this, but this Famicom version was not released outside of Japan. Plus, this version has quite a few differences. Anyway, you play as Kid Dracula. You know, I always wondered what kind of misadventures Dracula had when he was a kid before he turned down the path of pure evil. Well, this game is your answer to that, Joe. The game is fairly easy, but that doesn't mean it's not fun because it really is enjoyable. After beating a stage, you gain a new weapon or ability that will help you through the rest of the game. You use weapons or abilities by holding down the B button like a charged shot. These range from homing shot, ice shot, and bomb to being able to transform into a bat for a short period of time. The graphics are really good for this game. It does suffer from slowdown and flickering in spots, but it's not enough to keep you from playing. Like I said, it's an easy game and I only have trouble when I get to the Statue of Liberty boss. She doesn't even fight you. You have to defeat her by answering questions. Since the game is in moon language, I always lose. I have beaten the game, though, with the help of a fact. I thought the story of Dracula took place in the 1400s. The Statue of Liberty wasn't even alive back then yet. I think this game needs to check Wikipedia and get its facts straight. <laughs> Anyways, 
The music is good and quite whimsical, just like the game. I had a great time with this game and you would have too if Konami decided to have released it worldwide. The Fireman is an overhead action game where you play the role of, um, a fireman. To my knowledge, this game was also released in PAL territories, but they don't count, so that's why it's in this episode. Ah, so this is the game you were talking about in the opening. Apparently PAL territories counted more than we do as far as this game is concerned. I know, dang it. Anyways, there is a large fire at a chemical factory in New York. It's your job to put it out and save innocent people that are trapped in the building. The game is played with two characters. You control one and the AI controls your helper. Your character has a life bar and also the level has a running timer countdown. Your helper walks around and puts out fires with an axe. You know, I didn't realize the fire snuffing abilities of an axe until I played this game. I love educational games like this. The fireman that you control wields the hose. There are three forms of attack. Your hose can shoot straight or on the ground and finally there's a water bomb. What? No water balloons? I know! Anyways, you can hold the L button in for a strafe attack which is very useful on certain enemies. Your enemy in this game is, of course, fire. There are many different ways to put out fires. The straight hose shot is great for the majority of fires. The ground hose is great for fires on the ground that can't be put out with a regular hose. You might think that this is a boring idea, but it's actually pretty fun because the game will throw boss battles at you at the end of each level. Bosses can range from just errant fire to machinery that is on fire and has gone mad. Yeah, because that's what fire does. The machinery is super pissed off that it's on fire and killing humans just seems like the only logical course of action. Well, it's the only thing they can do. Well, anyways, graphically, the game is fair. Characters look okay and the fire looks great. The building and scenery are just average. The music and sound effects are fine. Music has a kind of jazzy upbeat tone to it and it fits the game pretty well. Anyway, you know, Dave, it's very rare that we see video games about fires. It kind of reminds me of Burning Rangers for the Saturn, but that was released everywhere. However, another fire game that was also left in Japan is for the Master System and it's called Megumi Rescue. The goal of this game is to rescue all of the Megumis from a burning building. This game requires a Sega paddle controller to play, but you can play it with a Sega sports pad set to sports mode and turned upside down. It's pretty twitchy, but you can play it this way. Anyway, you bounce off a trampoline in order to reach a Megumi and rescue it. Um, I don't think they're called Megumis, Joe. They're just people. Then why do they call it Megumi Rescue, huh? They wouldn't call it that if you weren't rescuing Megumis. Anyway, different Megumis will award you different amounts of points. For example, rescuing a cat is worth more points than rescuing a high school student. If the fire gets too high, people will jump or fall to their deaths unless you catch them. Once you rescue everyone, the fire truck comes and bombs the building. Yes, it bombs it. This game has a lot of fans, but I just can't get into it likely because I'm not using a real paddle controller and therefore I'm probably not giving it a fair shake. But that sound at the beginning of a stage, jeez that's loud. Didn't they listen to this game before they released it? Well, you know, honestly, Dave, I had never heard of the Firemen before today, and it's always kind of cool to hearing about games you never even knew existed. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, like that Master System you just show, I never knew it existed until you completely took over my segment and put it out there. And you couldn't even use the correct controller, by the way, to feature it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Says the guy who can't even interpret the title of the episode. You're talking about a game that was released in jolly old England. <sighs> Joe. Uh, anyways, whatever. Let's just move on and... What games are you going to talk about? I'll show you. Let's check them out. Sengoku Blade is a very Japanese flavored shooter. Mmm, yummy. My favorite flavor, Japanese. The title screen says Sengoku Ace Episode 2. However, the box says Sengoku Blade. So who knows what this game is really called? Anyway, you choose from a bunch of different flying characters. Each character has his or her own brand of firepower, assists, and bombs. 
You can power your character up and this affects your assists as well. These are activated by holding down the fire button. They're pretty weak at first, but some of them can be extremely useful. The bombs don't power up and are generally only useful for clearing the screen of enemy bullets. The first few stages seem to be selected at random from what I can tell. The graphics are very nice for the most part and is filled with tons of Japanese things and strange what have yous. The scrolling is generally pretty cool as well. Very pretty graphics in certain parts of this game, Joe. Like the dense forest in the beginning with lots of scrolling. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. The music kind of sucks, though. I mean, it's appropriate for the setting, but it's mainly just unstructured Japanese instrument sounds thrown together. It's certainly nothing anyone would want to listen to outside of the game. The game is pretty challenging, and it'll take you some substantial practice in order to beat it. My guess why it never came out to the U.S. is because it was simply too Japanese, and that scared pretty much any marketing department in the U.S. A funny story about my copy of this game. I originally bought it from Tronix, and I remember owning it and enjoying it. But then one day, I thought about this game, and I looked on my shelf, and it was gone. I hadn't seen it for quite some time. I assumed Dave stole it. Oh, naturally. You see, there's a large-breasted chick on the front cover, and that's the sort of thing Dave would steal. Hmm, I still might steal it. Anyway, he kept denying it over and over and over again. A few years later, a friend of mine cleaned out his closet. He called me up to inform me that he had found several US and Japanese Saturn games and that they were probably mine. Yep, Sengoku Blade was among them. Apparently, I had lent the game to him nearly 13 years ago, and I just got the games back about two years ago. Sengoku Blade finally found its way back home in good condition. And I'm still waiting for my apology. Devil Hunter Yoko was released in 1991 by Messiah for the Mega Drive. You're a chick who runs around with a sword slashing various demonic things as well as possessed plant life. I've got some possessed weeds in my yard that won't die. Maybe I can hire Yoko to help. Uh, what the story is, I don't know, but I do know that it is based on some anime. Apparently Japan just can't have enough anime and manga series. There are probably hundreds and thousands of different anime series and I find none of them particularly interesting, but I do like playing games based on them if they're good. I originally rented this game and I found it incredibly difficult. I wanted to crush the game but somehow I restrained myself. I returned the rental in perfect condition. The manager of this store would end up being my friend who kept my Sengoku blade in his closet for 10 years by the way. It was Bill! I knew it! Yep. Anyway, the reason I found this game hard was that I just wasn't playing it right. I discovered that if you hold the button down you create a shield around yourself and that can be used to protect you and can also be tossed about as a weapon as well. This makes the game quite a bit easier and definitely more fun. But don't think for a second that this game is a piece of cake because it sure isn't. It's very challenging in fact. Most people don't even get past Area 4. That's the stage with tons of annoying bats. Also, if you're a big fan of slowdown on the Genesis, then Stage 4 is the stage for you. This game has to be hard since there are only five stages. The fifth stage is pure evil. This game has some good graphics as well as some average graphics and spots. Obviously, two different artists worked on this game. Well, it's pretty much what you'd expect from a game with four mega power. Nothing in here will blow you away, but you shouldn't be too disappointed either. The music is pretty good. The first stage is a Japanese flavored theme, but it actually has some additional character to it and the music from other stages is even better. I'm not sure why this game was never released outside of Japan, but it may have been due to the licensed character. If anime and manga were as popular in the early 1990s as they are today, I bet this game would have had a chance here. Very true, but they still could have replaced her with Alex Kidd or something like that and they'd have a fine game that players abroad would have enjoyed. <laughs> Alternatively known as KO Flying Squadron 2 is released only for the Saturn in Japan. It's a sequel to KO Flying Squadron originally released in limited quantities for the Sega CD. And what a debacle that was. Now just look at how much it costs on eBay. Uh, I know, and I passed it up at Best Buy for $17 when it was new. Anyway, that one was a horizontal shooter, but this one is actually a platformer. It's pretty straightforward for the most part. 
You run around collecting bunny emblems for what purpose I do not know, but you can pick up different weapons and items such as a mallet or an umbrella or even a bow and arrow. As long as you have one of these items, you can take one hit without dying. You can then run and pick it back up. It's basically the same concept as the rings in Sonic, only these actually have a real purpose in the game. The game itself generally moves pretty slow, although you can run if you want. Your goal seems to be to rid the world of raccoons for no particular reason other than that raccoons are always up to trouble. Plus, they bombed your house, as raccoons tend to do. There are some light puzzle elements throughout, but nothing that will twist your brain in a knot. There is also a living roller coaster which can jump on your command and it feels pain if it lands too hard. Even the shooting stages make a return, and they're pretty damn fun. Perhaps even more fun than the platforming segments. But don't get me wrong, the platforming stuff is still really fun. What a great idea! A platformer with shooting levels here and there. Yeah, I know. The game also has a great sense of humor. The graphics are very well done with some nice scrolling and some great colors. The music is hit or miss. Some of the stuff is good, but most of it isn't tremendously memorable. Still, it's a great game for the Saturn and it should have come out in the US. It probably didn't because there aren't any polygons in the game. So, Joe, I was noticing that um, all the games you chose today, which are fine games, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, they all had female lead characters. Is there uh, something you want to tell us here? Uh, well, Dave, you know, I, I noticed that every game that you chose only let you play with male characters. Is there something perhaps you're trying to tell us? Um... All right, folks. Well, that's our show, and I suggest you go out and buy these games right away before the prices get hiked up yeah. way high on eBay. And we will see you next time. Dave, Dave, check yeah. this out, man. I got this game the, from eBay. Uh, he said it was never released outside of Japan. It's, it only cost me $180. I, you know, I'm not too into Super <laughs> Nintendo, but what? Did, did I get a good deal? Let me take a look at this thing. Joe, this is Super Mario All-Stars. It was yeah. released in the United States, you idiot. What, what is that language? Is that moon language there? No. Can you read that? Yeah. Oh, my God. There's like a million of these floating around. Are you serious? Oh, my God. Oh my <laughs> You're God. so stupid. I'll just take that <laughs> and add it to my collection.